Hi everyone. You guys had a great lunch, I'm sure. So, uh, post lunch sessions are not the easiest ones to handle, right? Because everybody has had their lunch and maybe a little sleepy, maybe had a coffee. And we're not promoting coffee though, although Nestle has been my client for many years. <laughs> but, uh, but we're going to start this session a little differently. And uh, I'm lucky to have some very celebrated HR heads in the country. And they don't need an introduction. You know, and you can see them on LinkedIn, all what a bit of what they've done. But I'm going to do a beginning very differently because we've got 40 minutes to go. And uh, I'm going to do a rapid fire round with them, a little about it, what they are all about. So here goes. A little differently, you know, all my shows have done it in the end, but this time we're going to do it at the beginning. Because it's post-lunch. <laughs> I did. Hmm. So, it's going to go like this. I'm going to go through these questions. Five options. Three seconds, you've got to answer. One by one, we'll start with Shilpa. Move this way. And then again, of course. And then... Next time we go to the second question this way, like that. All right. Back and forth. So this is about them, right? Got to know your panelists better. First question to Shilpa and to all of you. Given a choice, which vegetable dish would you prefer? A dish with brinjal, cabbage, potatoes, cauliflower, or none of the above? Potatoes. Potatoes. Cauliflower. Now don't ask me why. <laughs> this is a rapid fire. Potatoes. Potatoes. I'm starting with you, the next one. What kind of music do you like the best? A. Pop. B. Blues. C. Classical. Classical. I haven't finished. Okay, but you've chosen. Yeah. And the fourth one is rap, and of course, none of the above. Classical? I would have classical. Classical, anyway. You, Raj? I would say light Indian classical. Qualified it. <laughs> classical that? slow. Chilpa? Classical. I grew up listening to Manna Day and Mukesh with my dad. So, that's... See, now you're getting to, getting to know your panelists better. Now, this is not captured in any public domain, right? Thank you. The third question, little controversial. How did you like Michael Jackson when he was black or when he was white? It didn't matter. I liked his music. Fabulous. Sir, what was the question? When did you like Michael Jackson more, when he was black or when he was white? I think I have mixed views on that because I never liked uh, the way, uh, the skin color, but the dance, I like. That's it. it Mind blowing. Yes. You, Raj? I never uh, got too exposed to Michael Jackson, so I'll say I, I, I don't have any opinion on him. Ashish. So, uh, I liked his personality and the kind of the connect that he had with the, with the world. So, I would not say whether he was white or black, that, that's immaterial for me. I have to move fast because we got to get to the session. Which of the following is your favorite actor, Ashi? We'll start with you. A. Shahrukh Khan, B. Amir, C. Salman, D. Akshay, E. None of the above. Akshay. Yuvraj. Amir Khan. Amir Khan. None of the above. That's interesting. Which movie did you like the best? DDLJ, Kal Ho Na Ho, Diwar, Dawn, or None of the Above? The original Dawn. Diwar. Diwar, I'll say. I would say Dawn, the original one. I had promised to myself that it would be only five minutes, so 
last question. 35 minutes more for the session. So, where, Shilpa, I'll come to you first. Where would you choose your next holiday? A, next to the beach. B, in the desert. C, in the plains. And D, in the mountains. Uh, in, I mean, next to a beach, my daughter loves the water and sand. So actually, it would be anywhere as long as my family is with me. So it okay. doesn't matter. I'm a mountain person. I love mountains. You're like me, yeah, by the way. Mountains. We're all together. Let's go to mountains then. So. <laughs> right. I think now you've got a better sense of the panelists and I can go on and on. But uh, let's get to the session. We have a very important session, very fundamental question of enhancing leadership capabilities. And I think I love that because it's got to do with leadership. And I will start with... Um, the first question to do with today's times, and that is about what are your thoughts? And any one of you can go in terms of CHROs, what they have to do to enhance leadership capabilities in today's world of AI. Would you, Raj, you want to go first? So the question is what you're asking is that what CHROs need to do to Enhance, enhance leadership capabilities in the age of AI, right? In today's world of AI. <clears throat> so I think uh, for long, I think we have been always thinking that you know some of the data what organizations or HR professionals gather to figure out who's a great leader in the organization has always been dependent on you know getting some feedback from people, 360 degree continuous uh, performance and uh, and performance over a period of time. So I think with AI getting introduced or with AI coming into picture in HR processes, I think uh, CHROs can get far finer details about individuals uh, to basically consider people who can be a consideration set of a development initiatives, right? Otherwise, earlier it used to be very, very sketchy few of the parameters you decide and based on some people's inputs, you decide people who need to be developed. But I think AI gives a lot of inputs on uh, leadership style of an individual. It also can give a lot of inputs on pulse of the team which a person is working on. AI can also catch a lot of sentiments around that individual and I think the selection process can definitely be far far better with respect to AI. And when it comes to uh, development, I'll just uh, customized processes for different type of people rather than really people being given the similar sort of a treatment as a part of a leadership academy and everybody goes through the similar process of development. I think AI can definitely also help customizing leadership journey for individuals and I think that CHROs needs to harness that if I have to say that. Great, fabulous. Ashish? So, well, I agree to what you've Raj said, uh, uh, but adding on to it, I believe uh, AI, the full form itself is artificial intelligence. So it cannot be an authentic one. Having said that, yes, it will, you know, it can give you uh, data, trends, and uh, so on. But for more, the leadership or the CHROs, I believe they need to focus, and that's going to be a struggle. Uh, how do we really, you know, build the competence or the abilities to deal with ambiguity? How do we really make our team more compassionate? Now, and how do we really make people more creative? So that is what AI, because AI would not have a soul to it. So that's where the CHROs would have to, or the entire leadership will have to focus upon. Sure. Right. Shilpa? So a slightly different view, right? Everybody has been talking, especially recently, about chat GPT. And that's what is called generative intelligence. Uh, we were doing a strategy workshop and I work with DRG and you know that's a, a Alcobev company. We were doing a strategy workshop and we typed out uh, Alcobev 2030 and it actually generates images for us, right? Uh, to say what the industry, the shape and form of what could exist in 2030 with this industry it will look like. Uh, and when I think about uh, chat GPT for example, which is at the cutting edge of technology, I can see it's solving a lot of problems for us, but in a limited manner. 
we all do posh trainings in our uh, organization can you get that to do a knowledge check for that uh, training can you use it to get a uh, knowledge check done on you know consumer uh, the code of business conduct yes um, can you for example use it for employee listening yes but philosophically i have always believed that as technology advances our job is to make our leaders more human right and therefore equip them with the skills that human beings have that machines don't have uh, which means a lot of what we are called we refer to as power skills for example how do you navigate conflict social intelligence emotional intelligence all of that probably it's going to be a while before machines do it better than humans do so at least the way i have been thinking about it is some of our fundamental priorities of getting our leaders to become good at developing their teams and the line levels below them still exist chat gpt and other ai tools actually just become an enabler for some of that absolutely i think um, you know uh, it's very difficult to replace the human mind I and mean, it comes to intuition creativity etc i don't know whether it'll ever do that but strangely enough i did exactly the same thing uh, by the way and uh, i put uh, in chat gpt 10 top challenges for hr today in india guess what came out and this is what came out nothing mind shaking mind blowing really i mean earth shaking for that matter it said one attracting retaining talent two diversity and inclusion the usual three employee engagement four managing remote work talent development training managing compliances and technology automation so nothing else shattering i think this is some way to go as well because i thought with with in the context of india we should have got something else this are very open generic ones so um, let's not forget leadership uh, when we have seen many such um, so for example y2k happened dot com happened okay artificial intelligence has come but leadership we should not forget that leadership is all about people you lead um how do you lead without your people there is no leader um those soft skills uh, what what we should do is leadership is a skill which can be uh, bettered over a period of time uh, you you do that every day you practice it every day every week every year come what may whatever might be the circumstances that's what um, out here we need to stress that these are abilities these are uh, kind of attributes which can be learned and that's what uh, we should be focusing on yeah absolutely i think you can't be a leader if you don't have followers right true so go to have followers to be a leader <laughs> but you know what recently i have um, done a search for a ceo for a fmcg company and i talked to people you know ceos from one in london to tokyo and i've seen all kind of ceos but one of the things that uh, i'm seeing that more clients want is the ability to deal with the context it's not about content only it's not about skills content and ability but the context that they are thrown into is there any way to train and enhance leadership quality there shilpa you want to go no no please yeah i'm happy ashish yuvraj so i think uh, leadership is all about context leadership is less about content and more about context fantastic Good. otherwise i think that everybody can be taught leadership and one leader in one situation can succeed in other situation also had it been about the content right just because if you look at different arenas corporate world sporting world political world science world every arena has its own context and there are different set of people who will succeed in that rather than you you ask the same person to go to the other field and also succeed yep. important is <clears throat> that when you are looking at leaders a couple of things what is important one my personal belief is that when you have people skills that's something which you to a great extent come with over a period of time you learn functional skills in which you are operating are equally important for a person to become a leader whether you can call you can call it a content in terms of a context but context of a of a role 
definitely gets driven by the content of the functional requirement what is there you know a person who is a sportsman can't really become a leader unless he is functionally very good in the organization's corporate world if you are a functional leader in a business it's not that you are a very flamboyant and a well spoken individual you become a leader you need to really be proving that you are functionally superior than others and you can solve for them so for me i think it's all about context or rather it's more about context than content effectiveness of a leader basically gets defined at how you can also decide the content and master the content of that context to become a successful leader if i have to say i think a bit of what we've been taught in business schools about situational leadership maybe you're referring to that as well but um, your thoughts yeah i think um, what we should look at is um, hr professionals here like now we are saying that hr is not about hr hr is about the what value you are creating for business similarly for leaders um, what are you doing for your people uh, and how are we focusing on that um, by caring showing that authentic uh, leadership skills saying it's not simply uh, a lip service right i mean you should you should uh, actually uh, the people who you are leading they should feel uh, and they should they should be able to kind of uh, give that show that respect to you um, i think these are some things which are very very important which we should not forget yes and how, how do you deal in the context of things for example the environment is different your com- competitive environment is different you are dealing with different people and different organization and you know yeah, so you know context versus uh, so it's it's more about the perspective that you know the the leadership that will bring so a perspective can be different by different mindsets so and that's where you know the enhancement needs to be done so what perspective do i bring on the table how do i look things more differently what value addition do i bring in so that's where you know, my point is shilpa so as reading this uh, ddi article on leadership development and you, it said that you have to sort of look at leadership development in three layers right the and i'm forgetting how it's on a daily basis Uh, when our leaders show up and have those daily conversations with their team how do we want them to be experienced what is the kind of impact that we'd like them to make on the teams that they lead on a day to day basis a simple meeting in the corridor to a you know performance feedback conversation so that's one layer the second layer it said was and i think they divided into minutes and days and the second layer was the next 2 years are you developing leaders that understand what the business is trying to accomplish in the next 2 years uh you know what the capabilities that are most crucial to this business are for the business to stay relevant and then upskilling your leaders on those capabilities so that's like the second layer and third are you making them more employable over their 40 year and maybe 40 is sort of stretch now but over their 40 year career horizon um and in each of this sunan and there's a context right in the first one what is your ethos as an organization so for us at diageo india we are we take a lot of pride in being compliant ethical and relational diageo, and that's and diageo showed the way especially yeah. of this on, aspect yeah so and that's how we would yeah. like our leaders to lead right right in the second layer we would like our leaders to know that what we are putting a premium on from a strategy perspective for example you know it's about sustainability so that's an upskilling we will do for them so context i think defines the content yeah of or the approach for that uh, matter and pretty much you know whichever way you look at it short term yeah. medium term and long term fabulous and i think that's a great perspective but you touched on a very important point about leadership development what do you do in your organization in this respect and how do you do it any differently from the others ashish so in terms of uh, leadership development a uh, uh, couple of years back we we came up with the idea that we need to have business leaders i'm sure all industries would have that business leaders and uh, we used to make the forums we used to call them and we used to review them as business leaders but soon we realized that they need to be owning that so we came up with the, that they need to be business owners right now when i say a business leader a a, a a national sales manager would be a business leader for sales but today 
what we have been able to accomplish over the years is today the salesperson is not only looking at the sales. You know, he's a business owner. So he actually looks at, you know, how my raw material cost is fluctuating, so on and so forth. You know, how my productivity is fluctuating in my plant. So that's where from a business leader to a business owner uh, environment, our culture is what we have been able to, you know, uh, demonstrate, accomplish. The second, I would say, uh, which is very uh, near to my heart is a program which we are going international right now. So we did in India in 2022. And in that we engaged cross-functional people. And this is not a two days or a three days or a week's program. This is a high impact nine weeks program in which all the cross-functional teams come so far. And the most important thing that we try to imbibe people is, is a, a trait set of being an entrepreneur. So they develop and they act themselves as an entrepreneur and they deliver a project which is very, very quantifiable. And if they don't deliver a project which is not linked to their regular or routine KRAs or KPIs, they don't qualify the training. So it's a, it's a skin in the game putting over there. So those are kind of talent development programs so far. I love the thought of ownership, moving it from you know, just being leaders to being owners of the business. It's a different perspective altogether. You, Raj? So I think, uh, let me just step back and see how uh, leadership developments have been done in the past. You know, uh, Most of the time, organizations would look at people who are there in the cohorts of high potential employees, yeah. high performing, and they are considered to be the leaders. And they are the ones who are supposed to mostly develop rather than everybody being taken through that process. <clears throat> what I have started appreciating, and it is not <coughs> recent, uh, the days of that charismatic leadership has gone. And now the world has team members and the organization has team members who are very, very evolved. I think Gandhi is a charismatic leader because his followers were not very evolved from that point of view. So those days are gone, which were maybe two decades back. When a charismatic leader, a CEO or a founder is standing on a stage and everybody is doing hail uh, so and so. Now everyone down the line is so evolved, has a mind of his or her own and looks at leader from a very different lens. And if you want to have successful leaders in the organization, you need to understand that who are they going to really lead. If you understand that, then your ability to work on the leadership requirements can be very different. <coughs> and Second connected point is uh, that, you know, things are moving very fast. Economy has grown leaps and bounds. There are organizations which are throwing money to hire talent. You develop talent, somebody else takes away your talent and starts working. Your overall process of looking at the leaders within the organization should change. What I have done, and we have been doing, we have done it for the last seven, eight years, that we created a cohort of people whom we call bunker employees. And when I'm saying bunker employees, these are the employees who are not necessarily high potential. Okay. These are the, this cohort has mix of people who are your high potential, high performing, people with institutional knowledge and loyal to the organization. I'm sure that most of us would relate that many organizations when there are seven or eight great leaders, great contenders for a position and all of them are champions, uh, there are four or five people sitting below, they are never in the consideration set. But over a period of time what happens? All those five, six guys will move to a different role. Somebody who had not considered for that role five years back might have really taken up that role because he stayed there and he, were, he brings in a huge amount of institutional knowledge. So we created a process of identifying employees and putting them in bunker. And that bunker means you have people who have huge institutional knowledge, people who are very positive, people who can resurrect the organization in case there's a calamity. That sort of a concept. And then we thought that this set of people need to really be trained educated, rewarded, very differently than others, so that in a crisis period you can really uh, bank on them. And it came very, very clear and live during this COVID period, when you realize that most of the guys who had high integrity with the organization, very loyal, old workforce, they might have been in the category of solid citizens, they were the ones who, who basically did everything possible to get the organization back on, on, on its feet. So I think, and then training them, and next part is, again, my understanding 
has been that functional knowledge and power of functional knowledge has started improving and it needs to be more with an individual who is a leader. So my academy which we run, uh, CEO's academy, CXO's academy, these academies are run wherein that 70 to 80 percent focus is on building functional skills and 20 to 30 percent in terms of personal effectiveness with the help of case studies and rest of that. So I think these are some of the things what we have been doing and I think that we have been able to really have high impact on retaining best of the talent in the organization. You know, fantastic way of doing it, very different of course. But to me, uh, also, it seems a bit like guys in the, who are in the bunker, bunker hill, bunker guys, uh, are like the high ownership guys, isn't it? Yes. They're the guys with the high ownership. Yes. They're the guys who will stay, yes. no matter what the attraction outside is. Yes, yes. They're the leaders. Right? Yeah. Uh, compared to what uh, panel members have said, the, and the companies they represent, I represent a pretty young company just five, six years old. So our programs on leadership development, it's still working. We are experimenting with a couple of them, a structured 360 degree feedback with all the leaders, which throws up um, what are their blind spots, working on them using um, external consultants. But internally over a period of, uh, I think last few years we discovered there's a program we started, which is called Network of Teams. Okay. wherein opportunities were provided to all, all, all people, but people who picked up, um, a people from middle management to senior management, who picked up, became a sponsor, and then started running cross-functional projects, and started forming small teams. And then within what ground rules we laid out is, every network should be, should run for a period of 45 to 60 days, either a customer impacting problem statement should be defined with a clear success metric saying that how would you solve and then these it worked out wonders in terms of the ability to bring people from different functions uh, work meaningfully create those uh, create those guidelines brainstorm among them and kind of do a POC within that period and this provided opportunities uh, for people who have done uh, they have, we have seen that uh, they have taken up uh, bigger roles um, in our organization. I think uh, yeah. this is one intervention I would, I would say that worked out. The other one on uh, what worked and what didn't work. Sharing those and celebrating those failures also worked for us. I think uh, these are some things which I would share. No, that's fantastic. In fact, Shilpa and I was having a chat day before and she said, you know, it's important to table what worked and what didn't work. Shilpa. Your so I'm probably link it back to the point I was making about you know there being three four layers of leadership development and when I think about Diageo, uh, for us the kind of leaders that we want uh, we feel that it's important to make sure that when we hire and assimilate these leaders they understand understand the ethos of being a leader at Diageo. So we do a leadership development program at the time that they join called Accelerate. It talks about leading with purpose. We are one of the few organizations that says that you have to find your own purpose before you can lead your teams and help them define their purpose. It talks about leading with integrity again, because again, as far as our leadership standards go, it's right on top, right? Compliance, ethics, we operate in an industry where this has to be flawless and impeccable. And then it's about leading performance and teams. So when you assimilate new leaders into the organization, making that investment for them to understand what this organization puts a premium on is crucial and that's one investment that we make. The other is a little different and goes back to the second layer of leadership development that I was talking about. Each organization needs to have certain capabilities that help it you know, deliver in the market, it, which help it perform, stay successful and relevant. In our context, for example, and I'm sure it's not different across industries, maybe even three years ago, you could have said digital is one organizational capability where we want everyone across the board to become fluent. And therefore, that's an investment you will make to upgrade those organizational capabilities. Upskilling people on ESG could be one more. And the third that we make, I think, investment uh, is more in terms of when we go and look at our talent review and performance uh, conversations, we identify themes, right? Where we see that there are aggregated opportunities for us to help upskill our leaders. 
won't be different across most organizations. Emotional re resilience. When you're at a certain inflection point in your career, your ability to demonstrate emotional equilibrium in a crisis, that becomes so important, right? Agility. We operate in a world where the context changes every day and we need to pivot. That becomes, again, a capability that we want our leaders to have. So really three layers. Get it right when they come into the organization. Upskill them on capabilities which have business impact. And third, look at aggregated opportunities from talent reviews and other conversations and build those skills that will help them make that transition in their careers. You know, you talked about two very important points as far as I'm concerned because to me those are fundamental issues. One is uh, governance, the other is purpose. And I still remember the time when Anand took over and uh, in a business which has seen everything, and he used to say that if you take even one rupee in cash, you'll get sacked. In an industry like alcohol beverages. That defined, I think, the governance that he was going to be leading completely. I remember him telling me that as well. And he said, not the end of the day, it will be done instantly. The other thing about purpose do you think purpose and finding meaning in everything we do can burn leaders out? What is your view on that? I will let the others go first. <laughs> I come from okay. a company that <laughs> believes in it very deeply. Yeah, but can it can it burn can it burn them out? Finding purpose and meaning. See, uh, oh, that's a tricky one, you know. So. You mean to say that what takes on their health and what takes on their mind, you know, when we are talking about, you know, finding the purpose every time. See, you find the purpose and you go after it. I mean, of course, everybody has their own way of looking at things. But I'm saying to be absolutely, absolutely obsessed by it. Can, can it burn leaders? Yeah, definitely, yeah. you know. So, you know, the more focused is what the organization would want you to be on the purpose. The leaders would want you to be on the purpose. And uh, well, I say that, you know, there has to be an equilibrium or a work-life balance that has to be there. So how do you, you know, switch on, switch off? And when do you switch on and switch off? Right. So that's very important as a leader. You know, we've been talking about, we're in the era that, you know, wellness has been one of the very, very important area that we focus upon. So how well our leaders are, What's the what's the health question of the leaders? Right. So that's where I think yes, if if you don't keep a equilibrium and a balance over it, definitely it can burn out. Yeah. And finally, it's all about balance. You, Raj. No, I think uh, purpose. I would um, purpose and culture. Uh, I would rather take both of them together. Uh, purpose over a period of time, yes. Uh, it's very important for a, for an organization to have purpose, but at some point in time, uh, depending on the market situation, external competition situation, there it is possible that purpose might go a little bit tweak. But culture is something which will hold the entire organization together, um, including people and their leaders. So uh, I would say that uh, strong focus on culture. Um, when we have strong focus on building culture, doing things right, raising the bar always, um, there will not be any burnout. That's m my perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Shilpa, you brought in this. <laughs> so I think uh, for me, it's also important to define purpose for different people in the organization very differently. Having one overarching statement as a purpose of the organization may not really get understood by everyone the way it should be, right? For the leadership, there can be a purpose which is overarching organization level. But when you go down to the front line, to the real brass tacks, I think interpretation of that purpose can be very different. How do you really ensure that those purposes are also trickled down and also broken into manner so that it is understood by people well? And if it is understood by people well, perhaps there will not be any dissonance on it. What happens when people feel burnout when they have not understood the main purpose of the organization and they have interpreted it 
as per their own way in their own role an organization which might be working with a high ethics and values but operating in an environment which is extremely extremely corrupt to move the things going in the in the social ecosystem a guy from a legal legal function or a person who is basically in your listening function in case that purpose that person is working in an organization an organization has this vision of highest level of integrity and ethics i think that fellow will say that how will i really operate please redefine it to me or please calibrate it for me or let me know how do i really interpret it right is it at the cost of the business or it is not at the cost of the business how do i really still manage an equilibrium between uh, highest order purpose and the purpose what my role has so unless that is broken down and explained to roles independently within their own uh, you know limited area i think it will always result into a situation wherein there will be a dissonance there will be a violations and there will be people who will always have a burnout so it, it has a huge a huge possibility of creating burnouts in case it is not understood and narrated the way it should be as always you put it very simply and made us made it very clear for all of us <laughs> thank you so the way we look at it at drg right we have a overall company purpose of celebrating life everywhere what we encourage our leaders to do is find their own individual purpose and that individual purpose is a manifestation of the values that are closest to them it's a manifestation of their personal and professional journey and it becomes sort of a north star for them uh, it's it's not meant to uh, be a shackle as much as a north star for making important decisions for saying that i feel energized to come into work every day because i am doing this and then there's magic when the individual purpose marries the corporate purpose right it doesn't happen all the time but That's when true. it does there's true magic yeah. uh and we've not even extended this to all employees across the organization this is new territory for us as well so we are asking leaders you know the top 50 in the organization and you know I, i've been through this program myself given that i'm about 3 months into drjo to think very deeply about what their individual purpose is do they get joy from bringing teams together do they get joy from creating something do they get joy from solving problems you know do they get joy from being the source of hope and optimism and like i said there are times when this ties is so beautifully to our company purpose of celebrating life and then it just becomes even more wonderful so i don't think there's burnout it's 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 our north star absolutely and it has to be the north star in everything that we do i can see the time is ticking we've got about 3 minutes 21 seconds left and i want to throw it open to all of you anybody any questions to this fantastic panel i think we've had a great discussion this afternoon uh, there's somebody at the back can you take a mic please can someone give her a mic hi very good afternoon i am purna uh you know i just heard Shil uh, shilpa ma'am talking about uh, leading with you know having a purpose driven organization i just want to understand that uh, what are the ways what are the initiatives in which you can you know uh, build that culture at an organization level as well as at a leadership level what are the few initiatives that will help us you know start our journey into this so Uh, your name's garima no purna purna sorry purna and you don't have to call me ma'am uh, so uh, we haven't cracked this if i can be honest we are also on the journey right we are figuring this out uh, what we i think the premise when we started building out this program on leading with purpose was to say that we need to help our leaders find their purpose because that's when they'll bring their best to work right uh, and this program as an example has forced us as leaders to reflect very very deeply so we went through this process of actually getting 360 feedback from our current peers colleagues managers team members people we worked with in the past and asked very powerful questions about when do you see this person being their best right we were asked they were asked to respond to questions such as what is the kind of picture that depicts the energy that this person brings into a room uh and when we get such 
well-rounded feedback of how, how people experience us, how they see the energy that we bring into and the difference that we make. Uh, we then encourage our leaders to reflect on it and start defining their own purpose. Uh, sometimes they'll find that there's a mismatch between how they see themselves versus how others see them. And that again is an input into thinking about what is your brand? What do you think you, you know, come across as versus how others experience you? And then start articulating that purpose and socializing it. Socialize it with your team, socialize it with your manager. And people go through so many iterations, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten before they get it right. Because this one statement is meant to be unique to you and reflective of your personal and professional journey. Uh, it's not going to be just about your professional journey. You know, if you've had ups and downs in your life, very often your purpose will be reflective of that as well. Um, and somewhere I think it ties in with the philosophy of saying that we get the whole beings to work. You know, you, you, you don't just get your per professional self to work. The whole of you comes to work. So I don't know if that helped, but this is a start for us and this is how we've been approaching it. Thank you so much. You want to say a few words? Um, I can see time's up, but um, I'll take one more question because I've wasted your time with rapid fire. <laughs> There you are. Uh, hi. Hi, Shilpa. This is Anjali. Uh, on the quest, on the 360 degree feedback that you just mentioned, I have a question on that. So I just want to ask you, uh, when, it, when it is about 360 degree feedback, do you think that it always helps the individuals in terms of the feedback that they get? I mean, you know, sometimes it's just a shocker for an individual, the 360 degree feedback from the peers, from their subordinates, from their managers. I mean, do you think there are cases wherein it can just go haywire rather than, you know, just being bang on point and people actually benefiting out of it? By the way, great question. Huh? Uh, Thank I didn't you. get your good name. Anjali. Anjali. You guys, more? Yeah. I think, you know, it's, why do you call it as a shocker? It's a feedback, it's valuable. It's a question of a person getting slightly shaken if a person gets to see his real self the way people see. End of it, if you look at it, it's valuable. A bit like joy. Whether, whether, it, yeah, whether it, is, it is basically a bit of discomfort for an individual or whatever it is, he'll overcome it. And there'll be process to really help him overcome it. But the fact is, the, it's a productive process. And feedback, we all say, we take, you take feedback from everyone. It's up to you to accept it or not. If you want to develop, you'll accept it. At home, you take a feedback, you don't take it, people will not force you, right? But in the organization, there'll be people in HR who will be get after you to look at your behavior, change it, three months down the line, we'll again come and check. So the difference between the family and the office is that you know, there are HR folks running after you to see whether you have improved or demonstrated that improvement or not. But, so I don't take it as, uh, you know, it's a derailer. It's derailing behavior. Do Hogan assessment, you'll come to know that, hey, my personality is very different than what I what I look like, or what I feel about myself. Uh, for a moment, I can be shocked, but in a larger, a larger run, I'll be very, very happy if I am ready to accept it and work on it. Raj, on a lighter note, my husband says, being married to an HR person, you get feedback at home also. <laughs> so. <laughs> Anyone else? Right, and, yeah, Ashish. So I would say, you know, every feedback is, is very, very important. There would have been any, some of the other act. That's the reason that your feedback has been either plus or minus. Uh, now, how matured, how composed you are, and how you take it with a pinch of salt to improve yourself, uh, that goes upon, upon the person. So I believe the feedback, whatever it is, take it, respect it, and you can decide whether you really want to evolve, take it, imbibe it, or you don't want it. Thanks. Can I just add to it? Uh, I think it's the perception we create in others' eyes, and 360 talks of that. Yeah, who's, so we, are, uh, can, we don't uh, know who's uh, talking. Yeah. Can you just stand up, please? Yeah, thanks. Sure. So, I think uh, to answer Anjali, I think it's the perception we are creating in others' eyes. So, 360 is talking of the perception we are creating. So, I don't know, it would be a derailer or a shocker for a minute. But I think it can't be uh, for a long term if we really want, if we want to reflect and uh, be aware of. So, 
what we know of ourselves is not worth knowing. We just keep discovering. No, I would like to add what Ashish mentioned. Um, see, you are asking for 360 feedback, right? The person who's giving you feedback, he's not interested. He's taking time. So what we have uh, uh, mentioned clearly is a person who's seeking feedback, he should write in a statement saying why you are grateful that the other person is giving you that feedback. He's taking time out and giving you that feedback. And it is up to you whether you want to like it or you want to throw it in the trash, it is up to you. I think that's the right. perspective which uh, we should bring in. Yep. Great. I think we've had a fantastic session and, you know, we can talk about enhancing leadership abilities forever, for the whole day, night, whatever. And I've learned a lot. I don't know about you guys. I'm sure you have. But uh, having said that, really run out of time. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, panel. Fantastic to have you guys. Thank you. Thank you.